Miss Heath. Let's take our Bibles this morning and find the book of Proverbs very quickly. The book of Proverbs. I got to do something this morning that uh, really just made me feel good. Uh, I enjoyed it. It was Brother Hool texted me this morning, and um, Brother Hool is watching right now, and so don't think I'm talking about him behind his back. Yeah, but uh, whenever we have to cancel church here, Brother Hool gets angry. I mean, he, it doesn't matter if you have to, to walk because the roads are so bad. Brother Hool will be here, and he, he will. And he's he just he's going to be in church. And um, this morning I got a text from him that said they had seven inches of snow, and it was still coming down, and so they weren't going to have church. And um, he said that they'll be watching us, you know, instead of going to their service, they'll be watching our service. And he had a few of his folks watching as well, I believe. And um, it gave me great joy to, with all humility, be able to text him back and say, well, you guys will cancel church for anything. <laughs> and um, I don't know if he appreciated it or not. I don't know, but we love Brother Hool. And um, sometimes you just can't help it. Sometimes you have to cancel. There's nothing, nothing else you can do. I would, I, I, someone sent me a picture, maybe it was Brother James Knox, I don't know, somebody sent me a picture of um, uh, somewhere, I believe it was in the Philippines, there was a church that, um, that was, if my memory serves me right, it was kind of an open air type, type building, it had a, had a roof, but there was no walls, or not, not much of walls anyway, and um, uh, they, had had a, they had a flood, or a huge rain had come through, and the whole area was flooded, and the picture was taken from inside the church, and um, it wasn't nearly this big, but it was maybe the size of our middle rows of pew here. And um, those people were standing with their hymn books singing in knee-deep water. And um, they, the, the caption was something along the lines of, they'll do anything to have church. And that's convicting, isn't it? That's convicting, man. And uh, we, it gets too cold, we cancel. It gets too much snow, we, we cancel. And um, sometimes if we don't have running water and facilities, we have no choice, I suppose. But um, it don't take much sometimes, it would seem. Proverbs chapter 6, I'm just going to start preaching because it's getting kind of quiet. And it's got that awkward feel in the auditorium right now. I don't know if it's conviction or shame or what it is. I better just move on. Proverbs chapter 6. I'm going to read a few verses together. Most of you know these verses by heart. If you are a guest with us this morning, I hope you brought your Bible. If you didn't, and then uh, there's a Bible in the pew in front of you. You can follow along with us. We believe in the Word of God around here. It is all we have to cling to. If we don't have the Bible, what else do we have? All you've got to go on at that point is just the Word of some man. And I'm thankful I've got the very Word of God. We'll let it do the preaching this morning. And then we'll read it together. It says in Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 16, a very, very striking statement. When you come across a statement like what we're about to read, when you come across that in your, in your Bible, you ought to stop and give it more than just a passing thought. It says in chapter 6 of Proverbs, in verse 16, it says, these, uh, these six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. I don't know about you, but when I think of my Savior, I'm kind of like Job when he said that God is not a man like me. God cannot be touched like I can be touched. God is different than a human being like myself. God is much higher than I am. God is much holier than I am. God is righteous and sovereign in that righteousness. God is a little different than a man. God is the one whose word will judge me one day. It'll be God that I stand before and I'll be measured to his righteousness, not by my own or somebody else's. I'm just saying there's a little, th a little difference in me and you and God Almighty. And so when I'm reading God's word, and I come to a verse that says, these things God hates, I want to put the car in park and just study that for a little while. If I'm going to read something that God feels so strongly against that he writes it and spells it out in his word, I want to know about it. I want to know about it. And so we come to Proverbs, and Proverbs is so, it's one of those books where you can't you know, it's, it, we, we, in, in, in Hebrews, we can take a passage of Scripture and go verse to verse to verse and, and study it, but Proverbs is a little different. 
Um, Proverbs, if you have, depending on what, what um, edition Bible you have, I'm not talking about versions, but we have a Cambridge, and we have Schofields, we have, uh, we have all these different, uh, different editions of Bibles, different uh, kind of layouts. Some Bibles have the paragraph symbol at the beginning of not just the sentence, but at the beginning of the change of a topic. As if the writer slowed down and said, okay, that topic is done. Deep breath to start another topic, you'll have the little paragraph symbol there. Well, in Proverbs, if you have one of those Bibles, it's every single verse, it would seem, has the paragraph symbol because it's a new thought, it's a new topic. And so you go through Proverbs and you can't go very far without having to stop and just really think about and consider the verse you just read. This verse, these, these verses are the exception. We're coming to a portion in Proverbs where there's three or four verses that make up this big thought. And the thought is, to all those men, to all those women, to all those young people who really care about what God loves and what God hates, for all those of you who really care and want to know, these verses are put there just for you. If, if what God thinks about your decisions and your attitude and, and what you do, if that even really matters to you, then verses like this are put there for you. We are, in fact, I was just reminded of uh, this, this last week, there was, a, there was a man here working on the phones. I pray, his, his name is John, I hope he comes to church one day, him and his wife. And uh, we were talking about churches, and I was uh, telling him what the Lord had done here, and he said, so are you guys like the, 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 the newer kind of church or, or the older kind of church? And as if it was a badge of honor, I proudly said, we are about as old kind of church as you're going to get without going to Amish country. We're, we're, just, we're just that old-fashioned. We still have the piano. We still play oh, for Pete's sakes. We had, it's not a violin. It's a fiddle at our church. We, we're that old-fashioned. And we're old-fashioned in what we believe about the Bible. We believe that when the Word of God says something is wrong, it really does not matter what culture or society says about it. God has spoken, therefore, we know what we must do. That's what we believe at Faith Baptist Church. We believe that even though our government might pass a law that contradicts the Word of God, the Word of God is is sure. It stands. And so when it comes to topics like abortion and alcohol and, and, and obedience to government, we believe that the Word of God doesn't just make some recommendations, but it is the law. And if you believe that, then this portion of Proverbs ought to hit you with great force. It ought to have great impact on your life. We're going to read seven things that the Lord hates. I I grew up, and if if my mom heard me say, oh, I hate this or I hate that, she'd say, excuse me, we don't use the word hate. I mean, it was, it was a big deal. Oh, some of you kids or teenagers have told your brothers or sisters or your mom or dad you hate them. Had I done that, when I did regain consciousness, I would probably have to go get some teeth put back in my mouth and maybe have some bones set. I mean, it was, it was a big deal. I believe that's probably the reason why this hits me so hard is God himself says, here's some things that I hate. I hate. Now, this morning we will probably key in on one, but we'll read the, we'll read the whole list together and then we'll, we'll see what the Lord will do for us with this one that I'd like to talk about this morning. Verse uh, 17. Here's where it begins. Are you ready? A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Well, you talk about a list of seven things that will transform a body of believers. You just read them. You just read them. If every single person here this morning and listening at home would just consider those seven things, And not look across the aisle and say, well, I wonder, uh, there's no doubt in my mind how brother so-and-so measures up. I can mark him off one by one for him. He's guilty of all these. Don't do that this morning. I'm talking about you. The the Holy Spirit is not going to deliver a message for you to give to somebody else this morning. The message is for you this morning. 
And I don't care if you're, if you're five years old or if you're 85 years old. These seven things have the ability to tear a church apart or to strengthen it and bound it together. Now, let's, let's read them one more time. These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. We, I tell you what, that heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, the world has keyed in on the ability of the heart. See, God has always known the power that a heart has. And when we speak of a heart here, we're talking about the seat of the emotions. Uh, the place where thoughts are conceived. And, and before they become thoughts, that which is indwelt the heart produces thoughts. The Lord has known for a long time the power of the heart. God has realized for a long time that an individual's heart, if kept pure and holy, will produce and create holy and pure thoughts. But a heart that is evil and wicked will produce thoughts that are evil and wicked. And when those thoughts have taken hold, they'll produce actions that are wicked and evil. The Lord has known that since he created man. And Satan has known that it's certainly since the Garden of Eden. But man himself now has caught on to this idea. You know how I know? Because man will very blatantly put things out there just to make your heart devise mischief and wicked imaginations. Why else would they put a billboard on the side of the road with a half-naked woman on it drinking a beer that they know good and well will cause drunkenness and stupidity? and dull senses, and death on the road, and in medical bills no one can pay, but they'll put it on the side of the road as though it's the greatest thing. You know why? Because they know if they can fill our hearts with that, our imagination will produce all kinds of things to their benefit. I don't need to dabble into pornography this morning. The crowd has got some young ears in it, and so we won't go there, but the principle is the same. The principle is the same. If he can get our heart to dwell on and to love something that is not good and pure, our minds will then produce things that are not good and pure, and our body will act on those thoughts. God hates hearts that are full of wicked imagination. Hates it. Wants no part of it. What does your heart have this morning? I didn't intend to preach on that, but now it's there. You can do with it what you want. A proud look, a lying tongue. Those are things that God hates. Uh, it says, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift and running to mischief. <laughs> you ever known anyone like that? Feet that be swift and running to mischief. I'm afraid I've got some, some boys that are going to be a little bit too much like me uh, when they get older. I, my son, Josiah, I can talk about him because he's two years old. Is he two yet? Almost two. Right? Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. I know my kids. And uh, it's almost as though, as though he is excited about what he's going to do wrong next. I mean, he is just geeked about it. I walk in the house, and um, uh, Josiah, we, have, we walk in our front door, and the upstairs has a little, little rail there and, um, with spindles. And Josiah will be at the spindles peeking through and walk, looking down at me. And he, I, this is the honest truth. He is excited to see me, and I walk in, and one of the kids will say, hey, Dad. And then Josiah, he doesn't talk real well, but he'll go, Dad. And I'm like, hi, buddy. And he whips out a Nerf gun and just, I mean, he, he just can't wait to get into trouble. He'll run up to me. The kids will be running up to give me a hug, and Josiah will come running up. He gets about three feet from me, and, and this turns to this. I mean, he's, he's just that kind of kid. There's a lot of Christians that are the same way. There are, hey, there are some sitting here this morning. And you'll say, amen, those are thing God, things God hates. And it's almost as though you can't wait for the invitation to end before we're out and they, we're, we can't wait to get back to our mischief. That's the weird, that's how some of us are. God says, I hate it. I hate the continually running to mischief. 
But the thing I want to look at this morning is the very first one that was mentioned. The very, very first one that was mentioned. That proud look. That proud look. It probably seems like one of the most innocent things listed in this list. I mean, we're talking about things like wicked imaginations and shedding innocent blood and a lying tongue. And compared to those things, let's just be honest, a proud look kind of seems like a minor thrown in a list of majors. It doesn't seem like it's that big a deal, but I don't think it's any coincidence that a proud look is at the top of the list given in Proverbs. In fact, I'm going to go out, and this will be a very bold statement, and some of you may not agree with me on this, but I believe pride is the root of all the rest of these listed in this list. I don't believe that a person can fall into any of these other things that God hates, any of these other six abominations. I don't think you'll ever find yourself involved in those sins until you first have fallen into the category of a proud look. Uh, my, my dad used to say we need to be humble, and humility is the opposite of pride. And he said the hardest thing about humility is as soon as you realize you've got it, you've lost it. Think about that. You say, I need to be humble, I need to be humble. Oh, I'm humble. Boom, you're proud. You understand? Pride is so sneaky, and it's, you think that I, I, I need to be humble, and I know I, pride, I've got nothing in me to boast about, but I'm telling you, pride weasels its way in there and finds a home in your life before you even realize it. And it doesn't help matters any that in American society, the proud look is exalted and glorified. <laughs> if you don't believe me, Look at the front runner of the Republican Party for president. <laughs> hey, I, I, as a man goes for a politician, I think that he will, man, he will keep a straight line. I, I, he scares me. Man, I, if I was a Democrat, I wouldn't want him to be president either. Man, he is talking tough, but arrogance and pride, oh, it kills me. But it's accepted, isn't it? By and large, it's accepted. Look at your sports world. If the, only, if the only glance to God in gratitude is someone making some hand gesture just before they do their own celebration in the end zone, if that's all God gets, there's so much pride and arrogance, it must stink in the nostrils of God. Someone has the, has the nerve to hold a football in one hand and point to heaven before he does a little dance and do who knows what. And we think, oh, what a good Christian role model. Really? Is that the best we've got? We don't have very much, and it is. A proud look. And I suppose why my mind is dwelling on this thing of the proud look this morning is because of the, the, the family school lesson uh, this last week, and even up here, uh, the, the topic of Daniel. And so I'd like to go to Daniel for just a few minutes, and I'd like to use, use the king as an example. And um, let's, let's examine this topic of a proud look and maybe write some of these things down. And then here's what I would encourage you to do. I don't know if you'll be able to do this or not. Um, I, and, and don't say yes or no before, before I finish the sermon this morning, okay? And you'll understand why in a few minutes. But here's what I would exert, ex encourage you to do. For those that have family members that love them, I would encourage you to write these things down and then sit down with mom and dad or husband or wife or brother or sister and say, how do you honestly think I'm doing? Because this thing of pride will not be noticed by the proud. You, you'll never see it. You always view your, your pride as other people's flaws. You know, I'm, not, I'm not bragging about how, I, how good I am at this or that, but I just know that everybody else is not too good at it. You understand? I know I'm good looking because I'm not nearly as ugly as so-and-so. 
and you understand, pride blinds your vision. You won't be able to see who you really are. So you need the help of the Holy Spirit and maybe those loved ones God's placed in your life to help you understand and maybe measure yourself this morning. All right, D Daniel. I can tell by the looks on faces that did not go over well, and it probably won't happen in anyone's home this afternoon. And if it does, we'll know because they probably won't be back tonight. They'll be fighting at home. Daniel, let's, let's see this together. Daniel chapter 4. Man, if you talk about a, an exciting story from the Bible, you've got it in Daniel chapter 4. Hey, Hollywood could not have come up with this. I'm telling you, this is... I believe every word of it. I, I, I say Hollywood. It's not just a fairy tale type story. This really happened. Now, when we think of Babylon, I want you to know we're talking about splendor. We're talking about wealth. We're talking about knowledge and education and science and, and the engineering and the architecture. All We're talking about a refined people. I want you to just quickly... We don't have time to read this whole, whole chapter, but here's what's happened. And Brother Greg touched on a little bit this morning. Uh, the, the king Nebuchadnezzar has had this, this dream, and he doesn't know the meaning of it. And, and he calls Daniel to him and says, I've dreamed a dream, and I need you to tell me what it means. And, and Daniel's done it before already, but this particular dream is, is bizarre. And then Daniel comes and tells the king what's going to happen to him. And um, look what it says in verse... 29 of chapter 4. No, verse 28, chapter 4. All this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. Here's what happened, exactly what Daniel said was going to... You think you've had a bad day? Hey, a blown out tire on the side of 94 is nothing compared to the bad day Nebuchadnezzar is about to have. This is bad. Look at this. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said... Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? You know what he's doing, don't you? He's bragging. He's got an eye problem. Look what I have done. I built this kingdom. It's my might. I am powerful. Let me just remind you why he is powerful. It was not because of his might or his own cunning, or his ability at war. You know why he's so mighty? Remember where he got a lot of his wealth was from the Israelites? Remember that he took all the vessels of gold from the house of God? Do you, hey, let me remind you how he got so strong. It wasn't through his own ability, or his own honor, or his own might. It was through the sin and iniquity of a rebellious people called Judah. God said, they're disobeying me, and so I'm going to raise up my armies to come against them. It wasn't, it wasn't Nebuchadnezzar. It was God. Isn't it interesting that he calls the pagan armies his armies? This world needs to get a good grip on that. America needs to get a good grip on that. It's not, it's not our country. It ought to be God's country. It's not our army or our, our defense. It is God's. And if God chooses to remove his hand from us, I, I pray he never does. We can't complain if he does. But if he chooses to, we're in trouble. It's God. Nebuchadnezzar hadn't learned that. It says in verse 31, While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven... That right there would scare me to death. Can you imagine me and Brother Magnuson talking to me saying, Brother Magnuson, have you noticed how good a job I'm doing around here? I mean, since I became pastor, I want you to look at the changes taking place around here. I mean, I, I, honestly, I don't know another man that could, could do something like this. I'm mean, really, I got the people skills. My people skills amaze me. I'm sure they amaze you. I'm, <laughs> wisdom, boom, right here. <laughs> Can you imagine having this conversation as the words coming out of my mouth? <laughs> God speaks from heaven. I'm betting Brother Magnuson runs. He's probably going to be just looking for the lightning bolt. That's what happens with Nebuchadnezzar. He is bragging on himself. And look what happens. When the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, I'd be saying, Lord, have mercy. You know my name. I'm in trouble. O King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee. 
Hey, if the kingdom was taken from him, that would have been better than what actually took place. Look at the next verse. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee until thou know that the Most High ruleth the kingdom of men. Notice it does not say God ruleth the kingdom of Israel or God ruleth the kingdom of Judah. It simply says God rules the kingdom of men. Lest you think God's only in control of our Christian lives, let me remind you the creator of all things is sustaining all things, and he will do with all things whatsoever pleases him. Nebuchadnezzar is going to find this out. He's going to say, oh my goodness, I thought this was just the God of the Hebrews. He's ruling my kingdom too. Look what happens next. It says... And giveth it to whomsoever he will. Verse 33, the same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. And he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen. Can you imagine? Now, I don't think my mind is getting the best of me when I imagine that the king of Babylon, in the middle of his palace and gold and ornate... Uh, carvings and and all that he had. I, I don't think it's beyond reality to assume that he was dressed in the finest robe, wearing probably some of the most striking jewelry, followed by probably some of the most elite soldiers. I would say when he walked down a hall, people bowed their heads and, and got down in the presence of the great king of the then known world. I don't think it's beyond reality to, to think that. I'm reading in my Bible that that king, the same hour he's talking about how great he is, something begins to happen in his body. I, I, I've never seen demon possession. I like to keep it that way. I have some children that have made me wonder, but I don't think I've ever been in the presence of demon possession. I, maybe, I don't know. I've been in some building committee meetings where I was ready to, I was ready to call, oh, never mind, we better move on. I'm just saying, but I'm, I would imagine Nebuchadnezzar, can, can, you, can you get the picture? Something begins to happen in him. And he behaves in such a way, out of control, that those that are following him, those servants of the castle, drive him from the presence of men. He begins to behave like a wild animal. He begins to, to, to become unruly, and so much so that I picture him on all fours just tearing into the grass. And they say, what's wrong with this man? Man, like, listen, if you were to come in to church on a Sunday morning, now I know I don't have to wear a suit. I know you don't have to wear a tie to preach. I get all of that, okay? I like to represent the Lord the best I possibly can, and so I'll try to take a shower once a week for you, okay? I will, I will if I remember, I'll put deodorant on so I smell good, and, and I'll do that. But what would happen if you came into church this morning, and I was wearing an old beat up pair of jeans, t-shirt that was all stained up, and I didn't have any shoes on, and my toenails were all yellowed and caked with junk and nasty. My fingernails were, were just the same way, and I stunk, and I was running around like a madman. Now, I'm, here's what I'm guessing. I'm guessing you would not be where you are right now. And I'm guessing... I would not be where I'm at right now. I'm guessing you would have called somebody, anybody, to get me out of here. Wouldn't you? Here's Nebuchadnezzar, this ornate king, royal king, behaving like an animal. Look at the description the Bible gives us. Some of you were just thinking, when I was talking about toenails, you're thinking, does he have to be so descriptive? Oh, Oh, yeah, look, look what the Bible says here. It says that he ate grass and his body was wet with the dew till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Can you imagine? All of this because of pride. That was where it started, was pride. 
I've got six or seven things I'd like to give to you very, very quickly about pride. And here's the checklist. Write them down. Measure yourself by these. Here's some things that'll happen when you're proud. Number one, we see in verse 33, let's look at the isolation that took place when he was proud. Look at the isolation. It says in verse 33, the same hour was full thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and they were driven, and, they, and he was driven from men. Driven from men. You know what I've noticed about pride? Pride has a way of isolating uh, that which it has possessed. One of the most annoying and, and, and miserable people to be around is someone that all they can do is talk about themselves. Have you noticed that? Man, I, I could, and I won't, but I could give you names of people right now that I dread being around. All they can do is talk about what they're into and what they've accomplished and what their next big goal is. And me, 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 me. And before long, all the people that you, that you used to be like to be around will begin to distance themselves from you because that behavior is not conducive to true friendship or fellowship. It's not. I was so embarrassed so embarrassed. Somebody came to me, and uh, they were uh, they had been coming to our church for a couple of years, and um, they uh, they came to me and said, "What's the deal with brother so and so?" And as soon as they said his name, uh, my heart sunk. I was like, "Oh no, what has happened now?" And and they, they went on to say, "Well, I don't know much about him, but what I know is he must really be somebody, or at least that's what he tells me." Can you imagine being known that way? Want to know how good somebody is? Just ask them. They'll tell you. Uh, that's, me, me and Pastor Story were laughing one time. There was a couple of boys that came to church here in their, in their 20s, and, and uh, we were doing some work around the church or doing something, and, and uh, one of them, uh, we, I mentioned from, mentioned from the pulpit that if there was carpenters in the church, we need to do some trim work. And um, uh, they came to me, and one of them did and said, hey, I just want to let you know that I'd be happy to help with, with carpentry. He said, uh, I'm a really good tr uh, car uh, trim carpenter. I, I, there's probably nobody in this church that can do with trim what I can do. And I said, so what are you currently doing? What, what, are, are, you, are you employed? What, what are you doing right now? <laughs> For this expert trim carpenter, he didn't, he didn't have to do any of that at the time because he was currently in ballet school. Jeff, you know who I'm talking about? <laughs> no, not there's anything wrong with that. No, no, no. I mean, Brother Magnuson, if you want to put your tutu on and go to it. Okay. My, my, what, what I'm saying is, I got real concerns about someone. Well, he's in ballet school anyway. But I, my concern is not that he's dancing in ballet, but my concern is... No, that was a concern, but not the big concern. My big concern at the time was, why is this expert trim carpenter who does it better than anybody else in the church, why, is he, why isn't he doing trim carpentry? But he tell you how good he is. You better be careful that the pride has a way of isolating you from those you love, from those that love you. The second thing I see here, look at the behavior in verse 33. It says he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven. You think that's normal behavior? It's not a trick question, folks. It's not. It's not normal behavior. Pride has a way of making you do things that you otherwise wouldn't. If you don't believe me, just look at some of the biggest celebrities in our world today. They do things that the normal person would never do. Everyone else sits back and says, what is wrong with these people? What, what is their problem? Are they, that, are, they, are they that stupid? This Lady Gaga, is she an actress or a singer? I'm not sure what she is. Anybody know? Shame on you. Shame on you. Brother Glenn's like, oh, I know her. <laughs> Have you seen some of the things she's put on her head and called hair? Have, have you seen these? I, it's like she just walked through the house and said, Oh, a lampshade. I think I'll take that. I mean, we sit back and say, What is her deal? She needs some help. But no, no, no. That's what pride will do to you. Pride will make you think that you can do whatever you want to do, whatever just strikes you, and it'll be okay. It's, it'll be the cool thing to do. I feel bad for people like that. Because everyone else knows what they are. 
but they don't really know what they are. That's, that's sad to me. It'll, it'll change your behavior, and, and some, of you, some of you maybe know from experience that a little success can go to our head real quick. Some of you maybe have learned the hard way. Maybe you've seen someone learn the hard way that a little success changes a person, makes them think more highly of themselves than they ought. It, it'll, it'll do that. Thirdly, the appearance changed. Did you hear me? The, the appearance changed. Yeah, it's quiet, so let's just spend a little time. We are very, very hard as independent, fundamental Baptists. We are very, very hard on the ladies when it comes to modesty. In fact, I'll go, and, and many people listening right now will turn me off after I say this. I don't care. We are unreasonably and unrealistically hard on ladies when it comes to modesty. We take what we, not what the Bible says, but what we want the Bible to say, and then we throw it on them and say, you'll obey it because we say so. Shame on us. Shame on us. And then we completely ignore modesty when it comes to the men. Completely ignore it. You see, you, you, can't, you can't be consistent if you're going to take modesty and make it an issue of clothing. You can't be consistent with ladies and men if you're going to do that. You, you can't, because I, I've, I've, never, I've never had to go to any guy in the church and say, Brother, the skirt's too short, you can't sing in choir. I've never had to. Uh, skirts being too short or too tight, we say it's a modesty issue, and it, and it is. We don't have those in the body of Christ when it comes to men. And so we've narrowed modesty down to just the outward appearance. And in doing so, we have stripped the word modesty of the power and value that God places on it. Modesty is not just how you look on the outside. Modesty is a matter of the heart. And that's why men, I believe, are just as, if not more guilty of immodesty than ladies ever are. Because a man may not put on a, 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 an outfit or clothing that is, that is immodest, but they will have a proud look just as much as any woman ever has. The proud look is a matter of the heart. What you, not, not what you actually look like to other people, but what you look like to yourself. That's the proud look. I think I'm somebody. Mm-hmm. Put on these expensive clothes. Put the, put the big the diamond in my ear. Yeah, I'll look like somebody. You see, it's a, it's a matter of the heart. Godliness should frame an individual in such a way that when people look at them, they see God. Immodesty frames an individual it's where when people look at them, they just see the individual. I, I knew it would be quiet. I knew it would. I knew it would. Some of these guys, hey, hey, you want to talk about the appearance change? And some of these guys, I'm telling you, you're going to think I'm, I'm making a statement about, about the way a black man might dress. But I'm, I'm telling you, it's, it's not just black or it's not just white. It's, it's sweeping through our culture have you ever seen such nonsense as buying pants intentionally to fall down and then have, because you've done that, you have to go buy a special shirt to cover what the pants have now revealed. And, and, and then because the pants are now lower, you've got to go buy a chain to put on where your belt should have been so you don't have to bend down to your toes to get your wallet. You can just pull the chain up. Have you ever seen such nonsense? And that's where we are. It's where we are. I, I don't understand it. And you're right, Brother Mark, it is. Every generation has their own little quirks. A proud look has infested us. We must be careful. God hates it. It's an abomination to him. When people look at me, I owe it to my Savior to have such an appearance that people say, he's not like everybody else. There's something, there's something wholesome about him. When they look at me, I hope they look at me and say, that is a Christian young man right there. I hope that's what they say. Some of us are to the point where we're willing to drop the Christian, just call us young man anymore, we'll take it. <laughs> a proud look, God hates it. 
God hates it. Let's go a couple more very quickly and we'll be done. The appearance changed. Their understanding changed. Did you catch this? Look at verse, I believe in verse 34, we can get as much a lesson from what he lost and how it changed him from what he says about it when he got it back. Do you understand? He didn't stay like an ox in the rest of his life. He returned to his normal place. Look what it says in verse 34. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, this is him talking, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me. You know where he's just returned from, don't you? A place of pride. A place where he was dominated and ruled by pride. And he says, when I finally got saved from that place, when I finally made my return, he says, my understanding returned unto me. You know what I can gather from that? I can gather that when a person is proud and arrogant and boastful, he does not have proper understanding. You can talk to him and try to pour your heart out to him. You can try to help him and say, you don't understand what you're doing or what you look like. I just want to help you. And they won't get it. Oh, that's frustrating. It is so frustrating. You feel like you just want to walk up to the wall and just bang your head against the wall because that would be as productive as talking to somebody who is driven by this proud look. Nebuchadnezzar says, it wasn't until I returned to the normal state that my understanding returned. I'm telling you, you better be careful. If everyone around you looks like they have the problem, you might not understand what's really going on. You might not be able to see what's really happening. He lost his understanding. He forgot God, God according to verse 34 and verse 35. He, he'd forgotten God. He had to be reminded of who God was. In fact, this pagan king named Nebuchadnezzar, listen to the testimony he gave, verse 35. Well, verse 34. It says halfway through the verse, he says, I blessed the Most High. I praised the, and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Verse 35, And all the inhabitants of the earth are, are reputed as nothing, and he doth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? You know what he said? When he came out of the field after all that time and his nails were grown out, his hair was all matted and, 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 and so thick that it looked like bird's feathers, he came back from all of that and he said, hey, I had a thought when I was out there. I had a thought when I was being humbled. You know, did you know God is really in control of everything? He says, it, it just occurred to me when I was kneeling down to get another mouthful of grass and I began to chomp on that, the thought occurred to me, you know, I might not be the sovereign being I thought I used to be. He says, when I came back, he couldn't help but sing the praise of God. A person that's caught with this proud look, who's mangled in this lifestyle of pride, likes to sing their own praises rather than the praise of God. Amen, Pastor Summers. We could see lots of these in here, but I'll, I'll finish with verse 36. Very important statement in verse 36. We'll read the verse, and then I'll share it with you, and I'll close my Bible, and we'll go home. Verse 36. It says, At the same time, my reason returned unto me. Hey, you're in trouble if you've lost your reason. You, you, might, you hang it up. No, you're you're going to be a madman if you lose your reason. It says, my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me. Did you catch what he just said right there? He said, it wasn't for my sake that God gave it back. He already found out I'm nothing, but for the sake of the kingdom, God gave it back. We're, we're listening to a humble man now. His heart's been changed. And then here's, here's the phrase, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me and i was established in my kingdom and excellent majesty was added unto me my counselors and my lords sought unto me my bible's closed i'll give you this and i'm done you know one of the the most tragic effects of pride in the life of a christian it's not necessarily what it does to the individual but what it does to the body of Christ. 
Think about this with me, if you would, please. There's debate about how long Nebuchadnezzar was living in the field, eating the grass and all of that. We, we don't know. It was a long time. If his hair had time to grow out and if his nails turned into the nails of a, of a bird, that's a long time. Nebuchadnezzar just said in that verse that when his reason returned, it said, then his rulers and his counselors sought him. And so my question is this. What did they do when he was gone? Who did they seek when their leader was consumed by his pride? For all this time, there is no king. And they must have been so desperate. Now, I'm just speaking from a human standpoint. If I was counselor to the president of the United States, can you imagine? Think about it. What a great day that would be. I was counselor to President Obama. And one day he began to behave the way Nebuchadnezzar behaved. And he disappeared. We drove him from the White House. And for the next several months, he behaved. I said, drive him from the, warehouse, from the White House. And someone said, amen. <laughs> he began to behave like an animal. I'm just saying, if his reason and understanding returned like that, and he were to walk back into the White House the next day, I'd have some questions. I'd have some reservations about disclosing all of our national secrets to him. I'd have some questions. And so and I might be wrong, but in my mind, it stands to reason that if this king could walk back into the palace after being in that shape, and from day one, the rulers and the counselors come to him and say, King, we got some questions. We got we to have some help. I must believe things were in shambles around the kingdom. I might be wrong, but doesn't that make sense? They needed a king so desperately that when he walks back into work, they go on with business as normal as if nothing ever happened. So here it is. The most tragic effect of pride is not what it does in our own lives, but what it does to the ministry and body of Christ. Because when you get so consumed with yourself, you'll forget about the place God has put you as a servant. It'll be all about me and what I can do to be benefited, how I can make things go bigger, how we can press the higher, higher marks, how me, me, me. And the place God has placed you to, to work and to serve will suffer. I wonder, really, I wonder, in the day that we live, I, I've wondered where are all the young preachers? Where are all the 21 and 22 and 23-year-old men of God? Where are all the holy and humble and, and chaste young women that would grow up and, and serve God and raise a family and, and find someone? Where are all of these people? I wonder, because there's a huge shortage. You know what I'm convinced of? I'm convinced that we've allowed pride to creep into our homes and our churches. And we've convinced ourselves that we can go and do whatever we want. And have a happy life. It's pride. No worry about what God wants. No worry about what his word says. No worry about what God expects of me. It's just me, me, me. There's a tragedy is what it is. The ministry of God is suffering. You would think, people talk about how healthy our church is. Oh, we have 265 people on a Sunday morning. A choir had 50 people in it this morning. Yeah, if we're such a healthy and thriving church, then why is it when there's a need to fill the role of a deacon, do we have to pour over our church role and say, who can we get? It's because there's a shortage of people. Something has happened. Something has happened. Why is it that if a young man plants his feet and purposes in his heart that I am not going to give myself away, I'm going to wait until God brings the right woman along, I want a godly woman, I want someone who loves the Lord and will serve. Why is it that young man must wait year after year after year after year just to find a prospect 
that fits that description? Why is it that a young lady who has given herself to the Lord and says, I'm all yours, do with me what you will, must wait so long for a single godly man to come along? It's a matter of pride. It's a matter of pride. Because while we're off doing what we want to do, the ministry suffers. I'm old-fashioned enough to believe that God has prepared space for every one of us to serve him in some way. Whether that be as a pastor or a missionary or as simply a godly father who will work a career and raise godly children and serve God in the church. I believe that God might just be raising up my daughters to never step foot on a mission field, but just be a godly mother who will do the best she can with the children God has entrusted to her care. I, hey, there's a shortage of those. There's a shortage of those. It begins with pride. It begins with pride. Let's stand together, please. I have preached longer, I think, than I've ever preached before this morning, and You've been so attentive, and I thank you for that. I thank you for that. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me for just a a few minutes? I'm not sure how the message may have struck your heart this morning, but I trust that it has. Sir, what does your attitude say about you? Do you think more of yourself than you think of the Lord? Ma'am, do you, do you think more of your beauty than you do of the beauty of holiness? Do, do, you, do you think of your ability more than you would ever consider what God could do through you? you? You need to measure yourself this morning. The things I've given you are very, very simple. They're not deep at all. They're things that will happen in your life if you allow a proud look to possess you. I wonder if you'd be honest with me this morning, if you'd, just, if you'd be honest enough to say, Preacher, you need to pray for me because I struggle with this. Could I see your hand? Hands all over the place. Thank you. God bless you. You can put them down. Thank you. In the back, I see them. Thank you. Well, I'll tell you what you ought to do, and if you come here long enough, you already know what I'm going to say. What you ought to do is find your place around the altar this morning and ask God to convict you and to reveal every point of pride in your heart. You ought to get it right. Don't you think the ministry of God, don't you think the body of Christ has suffered long enough? Don't you think it's time for you to return to the place God has prepared for you? Father, you've heard the message this morning. Lord, I've done my best. and God, I've been very long. And God, I pray that you'd please take what's been said and make up for how it's fallen so short. Apply it to the hearts of your people. Please bring conviction where conviction is what needed. Lord, if conv- conviction is what's needed, only, only you can do it, Lord. All I would do is offend and hurt. And so I trust that you will take your word and, and do the work on our hearts today. For we ask it in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. With your head still.